Hello, and welcome to the Fear Channel, a channel with regular broadcasts telling the most chilling of urban legends, ghost stories, and forays into the darkest corners of the human mind. Those faint of heart or prone to night terrors should proceed at their own risk. Tonight's story is Siberian Cauldrons and the Valley of Death. In 1854, Richard Carl Mack was commissioned by the Russian Geographical Society to lead a scientific expedition of the Vilyui and Kona River basins in the Yakutian region in modern-day Siberia. This region of swamps in Siberia is aptly referred to as the Valley of Death. When Mack visited with local tribes, they told him that the region was evil, that the animals did not care for it, and sometimes people who went there would vanish without explanation. In his journal, Mack noted several large and mysterious hemispherical objects protruding from the earth, which the Yakutians called Olguis in the local language, which roughly translates to cauldrons. These mysterious objects were originally discovered by regional hunters. Without any technology to photograph the cauldrons, the expedition painted several sketches of what they saw. The red metallic structures purportedly were made of an unknown and incredibly hard metal with razor-sharp edges and an opening at the top which revealed a winding stairwell leading downward into a circular gallery that branched off into different metallic rooms. The Yakutian people in the region have myths that explain the cauldron's existence. According to their legends, the dome structures are weapons from a battle between Ergen Butor, which in their language translates to the Fiery Champion, and the Tong Dorai, which translates to the criminal stranger who pierced the earth and then hid in the depths, destroying all around with a fiery whirlwind. During the epic battle, large balls of fire shot up from the earth. At one point in the battle, a horrible sound rang out across the region, which devastated the land, knocking down all the trees and blasting many rocks to dust. After the battle, the surrounding region was desolated to the point of turning into a desert for many years, until the surrounding vegetation could grow back. According to Yakushin lore, this combination of fireballs shooting up from the ground and loud earth-shattering sounds occur every 600 years. Studies down into the layers of soil in the region confirm that such an explosion has taken place multiple times every 600 to 700 years. A local trader by the name of Savinov, who lived in the region, claimed to have passed through the locations with the cauldrons on several occasions during the early half of the 20th century. His daughter later recounted staying in one of the domes one night. Apparently even in the winter months, the inside structure was as warm as a summer's day, for no explicable reason. Local tribes had mentioned not to stay there too long. Men who stayed there for a night usually ended up sick. Those who took shelter there for several days due to winter cold and storms would likely die afterwards. A man named Mikhail Korteski later led multiple expeditions into the region, originally searching for gold. Of his expeditions to the region, he said the following. I was there three times. The first time was in 1933, when I was 10. I traveled with my father when he went there to earn some money, then in 1937 without my father, and the last time was in 1947 as part of a group of youngsters. The Valley of Death extends along a right-hand tributary of the Vilyui River. In point of fact, it is a whole chain of valleys along its floodlands. All three times I was there with a guide, a Yakut. People didn't go there because life was good. But because there, in the back of beyond, you could pan for gold without the threat that at the end of the season you'd be robbed, or get a bullet in the back of your head. As for mysterious objects, there are probably a lot of them there. As in three seasons, I saw seven of those cauldrons. They all struck me as totally perplexing. For one thing, there was their size, between six and nine meters in diameter. Secondly, they were made of some strange metal. 
Everyone has written that they were made of copper, but I'm sure it isn't copper. The thing is that even a sharpened cold chisel will not mark the cauldrons. We tried more than once. The metal doesn't break off and can't be hammered. On copper, a hammer would definitely have left a noticeable dent. But this metal is covered over with a layer of some unknown material resembling emery. Yet it's not an oxidation layer and not scale. It can't be chipped or scratched either. We didn't come across shafts going down into the ground with chambers, but I did note that the vegetation around the cauldrons is anomalous, totally different from what's growing around. It's more opulent, large-leaved burdock, very long widths, strange grass, one and a half or two times the height of a man. In one of the cauldrons, the whole group of us, six people, spent the night we didn't sense anything bad, and we calmly left without any sort of unpleasant occurrences. Nobody felt seriously ill afterwards. Except that three months later, one of my friends lost all his hair. And on the left side of my head, the side I slept on, three small sore spots the size of match heads appeared. I've tried to get rid of them all my life, but they're still with me today. None of our efforts to break off even a small piece from the strange cauldrons was successful. The only thing I did manage to bring away was a stone. Not an ordinary one, though. Half of a perfect sphere, six centimeters in diameter. It was black in color, and bore no visible signs of having been worked. It was very smooth, as if polished. I picked it up from the ground inside one of the cauldrons. I took my souvenir of Yakusha with me to the village of Samarka, Chugayevka district, Primorsky region, the Soviet Far East, where my parents were living in 1933. I was laid up with nothing to do until my grandmother decided to build a house. We needed to put glass on the windows, and there wasn't a glass cutter in the entire village. I tried scoring it with the edge of that half-stone sphere, and it turned out it cut glass with amazing ease. After that, my find was often used like a diamond by all our relatives and friends. In 1937, I gave the stone to my grandfather, but that autumn he was arrested and taken to Magadan, where he lived on without trial until 1968 and then died. No one knows where my stone got to. Ten years prior to his first expedition, his Yakut guide told him the following. Five or ten years before, I had discovered several spherical cauldrons. They were absolutely round, that protruded high, higher than a man, out of the ground. They looked brand new. Later the hunter had seen them again, now broken and scattered. Another Yakushin man reported seeing a tower trident-shaped object protruding from the earth in the region. Koretsky also noted that when he visited one culture in a second time in the intervening few years, it had sunk appreciably into the ground. The German radio station Deutsche Well reported that when a 10 kilogram nuclear device was being tested in the region in 1954, for unknown reasons, the size of the explosion exceeded the calculations by a factor of 2,000 to 3,000, reaching 20 to 30 megatons, as was registered by seismic laboratories around the world. In 1971, one hunter claimed to have discovered strange black one-eyed creatures residing within one of the metal burrows, though no future accounts have corroborated such sightings. In the early and mid-2000s, scientist Ivan Mackerel led a research team that traveled to the Valley of Death in an attempt to find the location of the cauldrons. The team used motor-assisted parachutes to fly over long distances of the region. Eventually, they discovered odd circles of vegetation in the marshes. The research team believes they found what remains of the cauldrons now that they have spent many years sinking into the soft earth in the wetlands. 
All that was left were these large metal circles submerged under several feet of muddy water. Members of the team then began experiencing strange illnesses, similar to those in the previous expeditions. Ivan himself lost his balance, had blurried vision, and became sick to his stomach. He also couldn't drink or swallow. After returning from the expedition, he slowly recovered, but while he was sick, doctors could not find a reason for his illness.